India has lofty climate targets. One of them is 450 gigawatts of renewables by 2030. In simple terms, it means at least an annual renewable deployment of 30 to 35,000 megawatts of power alone. To bring in that kind of installed capacity will naturally need a, a lot of new investment. And that's where the role of financial institutions as well as non-banking uh, financial institutions comes into play. If you look at the kind of money that we are talking about, then roughly the banking sector in India is managing at least two and a half trillion dollars of uh, finance. And the non-banking uh, financial institutions, uh, you can add another 160 billion dollars on top of it. That is a large asset management and if the decarbonization goals of the country have to be achieved, then it is not just uh, extremely important, it's actually necessary for the banking and the non-banking sector to focus on how they can accelerate deployment of finance so that more and more of renewables uh, can be deployed and we can avoid stranded assets in the power sector for future. World over, if you see, pension funds are uh, the wealthiest. Uh, the Norwegian pension fund is a trillion dollars. Uh, the Abu Dhabi pension fund uh, is huge. Uh, there are pension funds in Qatar and Singapore, which are significant. And if you look at uh, India, then uh, we have the Employee Provident Fund. We have LIC, which has been mandated to put 1% into, uh, into green finance. And Essentially, the role that pension funds can play is being a trendsetter first. Uh, recently, we have seen news of the Norwegian pension fund manager, KLP, investing in a project in South India along with Renew Power. Uh, they, they definitely play the role of early movers to be able to de-risk the whole landscape for future investment. And as such, just because they have massive assets in control, I think they also do play a very important role of moving fresh capital to where it's needed the most. And in that sense, also de-risking uh, the regulatory and the financial landscape, but also de-risking the projects uh, as such to be able to secure more funding in the future. So that's, that's a huge role of uh, leverage as well that uh, pension funds can play. And especially uh, in India, when you have uh, institutions like the Reserve Bank coming out with a paper on the importance of decarbonization, the growing impact of climate change and how uh, investors should be careful about where to put their money. The role of pension funds as such uh, cannot be undermined. At uh, two years back in Glasgow, when a lot of countries came forward and committed to what was known as long-term strategies for net zero. Uh, at that time, a lot of banks came forward and also made commitments on how they will fund clean energy projects. And since then, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a big buzz about what is called ESG funding. So, uh, you know, the environmental social governance. And uh, while you see cases off and on, on uh, in some countries, ESG being far ahead as opposed to some others, there is general recognition that the finance sector really needs to be far more cognizant of putting money into projects that are green and in that respect uh, it feels that the role of pension funds is primary and foundational. So taxonomies are essentially uh, what will define where money should come in, in simple words. If there is a taxonomy which defines 100, 100 technologies, then it becomes very easy for the investor to figure out which are the technologies to put money into. Uh, Europe has done its te uh, taxonomy, which unfortunately keeps room for gas. Uh, China has done its uh, taxonomy and uh, there are many other uh, countries in the world who have actually defined what a taxonomy should look like. India is in the process of defining such a taxonomy. To put it in simple words, uh, I think India will gain a huge uh, deal in terms of attracting big investments for uh, renewables and clean sectors like electric vehicles, battery storage, if it were to define clear-cut items on what sits in the taxonomy. If we are going to depend on how globally the taxonomies have looked like, 
and we will also keep room for projects which expand the longevity of hydrocarbons like gas, then we will pretty much be like the rest of the world, but we would have not been able to take a step ahead in terms of leapfrogging into clean energy, which is uh, indeed the need of the hour, especially when it comes to matching with the scale of climate impacts that a country like India is facing and the need to decarbonize at a rapid rate. But that said, overall, there is, uh, there is quite a requirement at this stage to come up with taxonomies that work in a global context and globally as well to be able to streamline what kind of technologies are best suited to be able to seek funding under, under, under those taxonomies. Uh, what kind of projects or what kind of technologies are best suited and I think that is going to clarify a lot of the fog that now exists uh, even in terms of funding hydrocarbons and, and, and calling them green and transformational whilst you have a lot of projects which are renewable and clean like electric vehicles, uh, like battery, uh, which are not able to get the adequate and timely source of funding as they should. So this is a very complicated question as well and I think a lot of people have tried to answer the coal conundrum. There is a way to look at it in the, in the short term, in the medium term and in the long term. The point that you made about importing coal is really a short term measure. We saw how last year there was a fake energy crisis, there was a fake shortage of coal that was created which was largely a problem of logistics or bringing uh, coal uh, where it's needed and it was a logistics issue and not a coal shortage issue. But to be able to guard against that situation, there has been notifications this year which are really making sure that if needed, there is import of coal to avoid any kind of an energy crisis situation in the country when heat stress builds up. And there is already weather warnings and indications to show how in the months of April and May, there will be more heat waves and there needs to be a preparation. So uh, really the importing of coal is a short term measure uh, to guard against that feeling. It might well be true that we don't need imported coal as such, but it's really a question of giving a signal to the Indian, uh, Indian consumer as such and as well as the utilities that we are not running short. Now as regards uh, the medium term, uh, that is a complicated question. A lot of modeling scenarios really show that coal will remain well into the grid by mid of 2030s, which does not mean that new coal plants need to be set up now, but it just means that existing coal plants will run at varying levels of plant load factors, and which is fair and fine, but at least it does not mean setting up of new coal. That's the clarity which sometimes goes missing because it is understood that because coal will stay in the power grid till the 40s, we really need to step up into new capacity. And the reality is that the existing capacity can really take the load for the level that is needed till the 40s even. And the long term scenarios do suggest that between now and any time in the future, any of the additional demand that needs to be met can be met by renewables. And for there, you, have, uh, you really have at this stage enough technology and enough advancement in battery storage, in wind and solar to be able to meet the issues of intermittency as well as the issues of pricing. I'm not going to go into details, I'm not a very technical person, but enough has been said about how the levelized cost of wind and solar is quite less as compared to setting up a coal power plant and therefore, if additional demand over the medium to long term can actually be met by hybrids of wind, solar and battery storage or even pumped storage in some cases as is being done, then the, 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 the reality as analysis suggests is that you definitely don't need to set up more coal. The coal that you have at the moment can be retained, those jobs can be retained, but those efficiency factors will vary depending on the demand and at least ex the existing pipeline that you have of about 200, 210 or 220 gigawatts is enough and at least that clarity if it can come that no additional plants need to be set up really helps uh, tackle the whole issue of expanding mining, expanding domestic extraction and expanding uh, more coal assets into the future which probably is not the need of the hour, but not definitely the need of the future. Recently, the energy uh, ministry made the announcement of uh, uh, renewable uh, 
renewable purchase obligations uh, and, and that uh, is a certainly good thing because it gives generation obligation, RGOs uh, and not the purchase obligations. Uh, that is a really good, uh, good sign to be able to ensure that, uh, you know, at the thermal power plant location you can have integration like that and you can also be uh, to, to be generating renewables in the first place I mean they have a merit order in any case but to be to be ensuring uh, generation is one thing and uh, you know to make sure that they are also in the grid is quite another uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, you know the uh, uh, flexibility in the grid is another thing that should be that should be uh, focused on something about transmission because it is one thing to be able to generate that power but it is quite another to wheel it at the right time and we've seen curtailment issues in the past and to be able to tackle that so ma making sure that uh, transmission is being dealt with and lastly i think it's always the issue of finance in the end even if it's not a regulatory issue but to be able to give enough signals to international investors as well and domestic that the projects themselves are de-risked in a fair bit of capacity, whether they are solar projects or uh, any other, but just to be able to give that indication that they don't risk in terms of uh, either finance, in terms of policy regulation in the country, or in terms of uh, you know giving them credit guarantees, or even in terms of uh, currency fluctuations, just ensuring all of that kind of de-risking of these projects will just give greater confidence because we do know that despite very ambitious targets, even last year and the year before that, there has been a bit of struggle to bring the adequate level of finance that is needed. So given that it's the most important consideration in the room, having proper regulation and ways to deal with finance as well, so that it deals uh, with the renewable obligations and as such helps India meets, meet its climate targets, I think will help close the loop.